Good morning and welcome to day two of the Rural Child Hunger Summit. My name is Brianna Webster Campbell and I serve as a Director of Education and Training in the No Kid Hungry Center for Best Practices. In addition to that role, I also serve as the co-chair of the program team Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, which makes me even more excited about this morning's session. Inequity in food systems, the impacts of whiteness and COVID-19 on food insecurity. I am extremely happy that we were able to bring two phenomenal speakers to address this important topic today. But before that, I'd like to turn it over to Luis Gomez from Community Language Cooperative, who's gonna go over a few housekeeping items for us. Luis, next slide. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Luis Gomez. I'm here with the Community Language Cooperative and joining me today is my colleague, Ruth Andrade. We're here as Spanish interpreters. Today we have a commitment to language justice and we're going to establish that by using a simultaneous interpretation feature through Zoom. Once we activate it, you'll see a small globe appear on the bottom right hand of your screen if you're joining through a computer. If you're joining us through a cell phone or a tablet, you can select the three dots option uh, where it says more and the interpretation feature can be found there. There you'll be able to select whether you wish to uh, participate in English or in Spanish. This allows everyone to be able to participate, listen, ask questions, and to be able to do so in the language of their heart, the language that they speak with their families. Also on accessibility, we do have closed captioning available. You can click the closed caption option and then you'll have a, a few options to select from there. Muy buenos días, mi nombre es Luis Gómez. Estoy aquí con la Cooperativa Comunitaria de Lenguaje como intérprete de español. Hoy se une mi colega Ruth Andrade y vamos, tenemos un compromiso el día de hoy hacia la justicia lingüística. Vamos a establecerla al utilizar una función de interpretación simultánea a través de Zoom. Ya que la activemos, verán un pequeño globo terráqueo aparecer en la parte de la derecha de abajo de su pantalla si se une por una computadora. Si esta mañana se une con un teléfono celular o una tableta, podrá seleccionar la opción de los tres puntos y la función de interpretación la podrá encontrar ahí. Ahí podrá seleccionar si desea participar en inglés o en español. Esto permite que todos podamos participar, escuchar, hacer preguntas y poder hacerlo de la misma manera en el idioma de nuestro corazón, el que hablamos con nuestras familias. Si también necesita... Eh, también tenemos la opción de subtítulos. Si puede seleccionar donde dice Closed Caption, ahí podrá encontrar varias opciones para tener subtítulos. Vamos a activar la función de interpretación. Si en cualquier momento durante la reunión tiene algún problema o alguna pregunta, nos podemos comunicar a través del chat. We're going to start the interpretation feature now. If at any point throughout the meeting you have any issues or any questions, we can communicate via the chat. We can go ahead and turn on the feature and we will be all set. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Luis. Next slide. Should anyone run into any technical challenges today, please try to just refresh your browser. And if that doesn't work, you can also email Elaine at argus-events.com. Next slide. We will also have, um, although the chat box will actually be disabled for this session, we will have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can direct your thoughts or questions to the speakers throughout the next throughout really all of the sessions today. And last but not least, please don't forget to follow us on social media throughout the day. We would love to engage with you in this way. Next slide. Next slide. Great. So here at Share Our Strength, we recognize how inextricably linked food justice is with racial justice. We also understand that systemic racism is a root cause of childhood hunger, and we have to adapt our program strategies to reflect that. As one example, since the pandemic began, we began um, targeting the majority, nearly 70% of our No Kid Hungry grants to organizations working primarily in communities of color. And although we're not necessarily the leaders in food justice, or at least not yet, Share Our Strength is committed to working in solidarity and lifting up those voices of individuals and organizations who really center racial justice as well as ending systemic racism that has plagued far too many black and brown communities since our country's inception. Since this is the Rural Summit, all of us here today I'm sure recognize the many challenges faced by those living in rural communities, such as a lack of infrastructure adequate transportation, broadband internet, food access, and more. But more importantly, we also recognize the tremendous assets and strengths of these very same communities, such as resiliency 
strong relationships, the strength of families, and not to mention the vital role that the faith community plays. I was personally raised by two amazing parents that may be watching this, this summit right now. Um, both of them grew up in farms in rural North Carolina. In fact, my mom's childhood home wasn't too far from Duke University. She came from a small town called Rougemont. I was taught so many important lessons from my family and especially my grandparents, none of whom had running water or even graduated high school. And when I was young, I remember going out to the outhouse to use the restroom or drinking from the dipper of our well, but probably some of my fondest memories centered around food. Good, healthy, homegrown fruits and vegetables that I was able to see and even help pick from the garden if I wanted to. So even though my family may have lacked many of the modern luxuries that most of us take for granted today, the one thing that we did not lack was love. So now that you know a little bit about me and what brings me to this work on more of a personal level, I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers for the hour, both of whom come to us from Duke University located in Durham, North Carolina. One thing that I didn't mention a few minutes ago was that I grew up in Chapel Hill and I also attended the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, home of the growth rates are in case you don't know. And yes, I know that we lost last week, but that's beyond the point. I just wanna say that we have a very rivalry with Duke and I'm gonna leave it at that. The No Kid Hungry campaign began part of Duke World Food Policy Center in 2019. And last year, we put a paper together called Rural Child Hunger and Faith Engagement. This report identifies themes, barriers, and opportunities for addressing rural child hunger within faith-based organizations and communities. And that's where we first met our first speaker, Jen Zuckerman. Jen, um, she is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Duke University's World Food Policy Center which focuses on people-first policy development for equitable food policy. In addition to her position with Duke, she co contracts with Biowa Emergent Equity, facilitating white caucuses and nonprofit and th philanthropic organizations. Also contracts with DEI Works Collective, where she is a racial equity facilitator. Prior to her current work, she spent 12 years at Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation where she served as a senior program officer for healthy living, as well as the director of strategic partnerships. And our second speaker is Dr. Carolyn Barnes. Dr. Barnes is an assistant professor in the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke. Her research agenda broadly explores the social and political implications of social policy on low, in, low income populations in the areas of childcare policy, family services, and supports for young children. Her forthcoming book, State of Empowerment, examines how publicly funded after school programs shape the political behavior of low income parents. Dr. Barnes has initiated a new line of interdisciplinary research that examines how social policy implementation reproduces racial inequality in rural Southern communities. She received her PhD in political science and public policy from the University of Michigan where she worked as an affiliate of the National Poverty Center. We are just so grateful to have both of you here today. And with that, I will turn it over to Jen. Thank you so much, Brianna. Um, and I really appreciate you mentioning that you're from Chapel Hill and that you went to UNC because even though I work at Duke University, uh, I grew up in Raleigh and I went to NC State. So we've got uh, all, all of the rivalries here in the Triangle area represented. So, so glad to be here. Um, I do also wanna acknowledge that uh, we at Duke University um, and the whole Durham area, want to acknowledge that where we are is on the land of the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation. Uh, so very much first acknowledge um, on whose land we actually sit. Uh, and then I want to just thank everybody for having us here. It's, um, it's been so great to be able to have this partnership with Share Our Strength and No Kid Hungry. 
and am so excited to be here today, getting to speak to the work uh, that was led by Alison Conrad. She'll be joining us for the Q&A section of this. Uh, she's been do doing actually a lot of presentations on white supremacy culture and the work that she's led. And then so also honored to be here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Carolyn Barnes. So next slide, please. So in this presentation, I'll be sharing our research framing. Um, I'll also talk specifically through some key definitions that will really help set the context for our conversation today. Um, there were eight white narratives that were uh, derived in this research. Uh, based on time, I will touch on one or two of those. And then I'll go into what's next. And what's next is really about how you as an individual and how your organizations can either start or deepen your own learning journeys in this space. Next slide, please. So I wanna share that the impetus for this research began as a result of the work that we were leading through the World Food Policy Center in Durham, North Carolina. And we were charged with the question of how do you make Durham a model food community? Um, and as soon as we you know, kind of left the confines of Duke University and actually started out into community, the response that we got was uh, whose model and for whom, which was a great checking for us uh, and a great checking for me as someone at Duke University. And this really led us on a path of unpacking our own whiteness and the whiteness of our own organization, which is the key to what's so critical about this work. Um, and we were really lucky also to already be in relationship with several food justice leaders in Durham. And what we've done in a collaborative way was really start to frame these questions differently. So instead of asking, how do you make Durham a model food community? We began asking, how do you decolonize food in Durham? Next slide, please. So critical to the process of decolonizing food is unpacking whiteness. And whiteness is an ideology. It's based on beliefs, values, behaviors, habits, and attitudes, which result in unequal distribution of power and privilege based on skin color. So whiteness, where we are in the United States is the dominant culture. It sets the norms and it renders white supremacy invisible to those who benefit it, from it. And so as a white woman, I've benefited from whiteness for my entire life, but it's only by understanding that it's there and I, am I able to start seeing it. And it takes unlearning to recognize how we've been socialized in white supremacy, irrespective of race, we've all been socialized into white supremacy culture. And then it takes relearning about the history of systemic racism and racial equity for us to be able to operate differently. And operating differently is the key here because it's not just about what we know, it's critical what you do. Next slide, please. So the policy question that we asked uh, for the research that Ali undertook was, how do white supremacy culture narratives show up specifically in food insecurity and food access work? Next slide, please. So I wanna share this framing from Rachel Slocum, who is a preeminent researcher on whiteness and food systems. And she really names specifically how whiteness shows up <clears throat> in the food system, specifically how it articulates these white ideals of health and nutrition. It also offers these whitened dreams of farming and gardening that erase the past and the presence of race in agriculture. And then it also mobilizes funding that directs programming uh, to white beneficiaries and away from, um, to be done on the part of non-white communities. Next slide, please. So uh, next I'd like to go into a few key definitions that will just kind of help us with our framing. Next slide, please. 
So white supremacy culture, and sorry, well, I'm just kind of rearranging this uh, dining room that I've been in for a year. Uh, so I'd like to recommend just a little bit of uh, taking some time to do some deep learning. So of white supremacy culture as a frame, because most often white supremacy brings to mind the Klan or white nationalists, but white supremacy culture is something that we've all been socialized into. And there's um, two resources at the bottom of this slide. Um, and uh, we've had the benefit of doing work with Tema Okun's group um, and members uh, from this area. Tema's from the Durham area. Uh, and she has a excellent paper on the characteristics of white supremacy culture. So white supremacy culture is an ideology that treats white people and their ideas thoughts, beliefs, and actions as inherently superior to people of color uh, and their ideas, thoughts, behaviors, and actions. And uh, everyone in the US is affected by white supremacy culture. It's present in all institutions in our society. Next slide, please. So building on the concept of white supremacy culture, um, is this concept of structural racism. And structural racism is a really important frame because it encompasses this entire system of white domination. And what structural racism involves is this reinforce, reinforcing effect of multiple institutions, of cultural norms, of history and the present. And what this does is it continually reproduces old forms and produces new forms of racism. And structural racism is the most pervasive form of racism and the basis for all other forms of racism. And these definitions are really important to understand because it's moving us from this concept that racism is something that you know, only bad people do. Um, and what this work is about is a calling in. So it's not to call out uh, people as individuals to say you are a racist, it's to call us in to recognize how this white supremacy culture is in everything that we do and everywhere that we operate and really see how this work affects us as individuals, how this affects our organizations and how this affects the work that we do. Next slide, please. So to be a little bit more specific about how this work, how structural racism, whiteness and white supremacy affect the work that we do, I wanna think about the concepts of food desert as opposed to food apartheid. Uh, and food desert is a term that was coined by the USDA. And it's a term that, um, you know, as Brianna read the, the work that I've done uh, previously, I've used the word food desert um, for decades, probably. Um, I think it's, it came out in the early 2000s and it's, it's a word that I used because I thought it was really defining what was going on. But when we think about what desert means, I mean, desert uh, creates this idea of this arid space that's a natural phenomenon um, and that there's no life or resilience there. And what the term food desert ignores is that this is not something that was naturally created. Rather, uh, food apartheid is something that acknowledges that lack of access to healthy food is really about policies, practice, and systems that have created those inequalities in communities. Next slide, please. So what's important uh, to understand how to move forward is to understand how to get here. So part of our work in decolonizing food in Durham is understanding how the inequities in Durham have come to be. Next slide, please. And for the sake of time, uh, I'm just gonna name a few specifics on here um, and talking specifically about if we're thinking about the concept of food apartheid and the fact that there, it is all about 
disinvestment rooted in racist policies and practice that have happened throughout our, our history. So we really need to understand the intentionality of those policies previously to really be able to move forward um, to both unwind inequitable policy and then begin to form more equitable policy. So, um, so much of what happens around, um, if we think about, you know, why people are hungry, uh, it is about lack of power, lack of benefit and lack of ownership. So we're thinking about these lack of resources and how did those come to be? So if we think about land uh, and land is such a critical part of wealth building in the United States. And in 1483, uh, as part of colonization, there was the doctrine of discovery, which was um, decreed by Pope Alexander XI. And what the doctrine of discovery essentially said was that indigenous peoples, uh, because they had not accepted Christianity, were uh, then subhuman. Therefore, their land could be taken and they could either be murdered or enslaved um, and that it was the right of the colonizers to come in and take that land by a decree of the Pope. Um, so thinking back to just for, to 1483 and how that really has set this trajectory that has continued. So if we think about something like housing segre segregation, uh, but in the US between 1935 and 1940, the Homeowners Loan Corporation created these neighborhood risk maps. And I think you might be familiar with them. They're called redlining maps. And what those did was, um, create sections of communities where uh, public resources were not going to go in. They were deemed less than. And these were predominantly black and brown neighborhoods. Also, this made it uh, difficult and often impossible for black and brown families to get home loans. So with the basis of wealth being land and home ownership in the United States, this really started this uh, massive racial wealth gap uh, that we see today. Uh, it was exacerbated by racist urban planning, thinking about policies like in the 50s and 60s, the urban renewal that basically went in and raised black and brown neighborhoods to build freeways, uh, for example. And then if we look at the racial wealth gap and access to capital, um, and I really uh, appreciate Brianna talking about Rougemont at the beginning. So um, what it was in terms of land ownership and particularly farm ownership uh, in rural communities. And there was a 1964 study by the Johnson administration that basically showed racial discrimination in every USDA program. Uh, so this lack of access to resources really exacerbated this racial wealth gap. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna take a little time now to go into the white supremacy culture narratives. Next slide, please. So the research that Ali conducted was done through literature review and interviews with food justice leaders. And what she looked to do was see what came up in the literature and uh, listen to how those themes recurred in these interviews and these, Narratives, there are eight specific narratives. We won't go into all eight today, uh, but they stem out of three specific aspects of white supremacy culture. The first being individualism, which really stresses the needs of the individual over the group, which leads to individual solutions as opposed to systemic solutions to problems that we're facing. The next being paternalism, which is really this focus on who's making decisions from whom. And most of the time, this external force making decisions for others uh, without any kind of communication from those most affected by the issues. Then the third um, su su white supremacy culture theme of neoliberalism, which is that bootstraps mentality. And it really replaces social supports with market-based solutions. Uh, and, and also for so many, probably of those of us in the audience today, also puts, takes the burden of supporting communities 
also off of what government systems can be doing and puts it onto nonprofits. Next slide, please. So what do these narratives have in common? These narratives all focus on funding programs that emphasize these individual actions and behaviors, as opposed to fixing the systems and structural issues that are the root causes of the problems. Uh, they also involve this unequal distribution of power, uh, also the unequal distribution of ownership and decision-making in food policy and programming. Next slide, please. So as an example of paternalism, one of the themes that arose was the fact that, uh, or the concept that communities can't take care of themselves. And what communities can't take care of themselves really speaks to is it pathologizes people. So what this does is it blames the individual for the outcomes of systems. And it's based in these negative racial and class stereotypes. And basically it assumes that outside organizations know better than community members. Next slide, please. And I'll give the example um, and I will you know, name that this is something that when I was at Blue Cross Foundation, um, I invested in. So I invested in white led organizations to get a mobile produce market to go into communities of color. Um, and basically what happens uh, in this situation is that a white led institution gets resources. So folks get paid, they get um, infrastructure like a van or something like that. And nothing changes significantly in a community other than, you know, somebody, you, you, you do get some vegetables, but there's no substantial change in community. Next slide, please. I also wanted to talk about the focus on food charity, and this really comes out of neoliberalism, and it's rooted in the idea that hunger and poverty are an issue of individual responsibility and work ethic. Um, and I'll start to wrap up here because this, this really uh, transitions well to Dr. Barnes presentation. What this does it is, is it asks, you know, how do we food, feed people instead of asking why people are hungry? Uh, and it really doesn't talk about the structural factors that have created a system where hunger is so prevalent. Uh, next slide, please. And so Dr. Barnes is really gonna be talking about uh, the, um, the barriers to SNAP and WIC and experiences with SNAP and WIC, part particularly um, as a result of COVID um, and this responsibility of the government to provide care for the most, uh, most vulnerable. Next slide, please. And last slide, please. So I'll just leave this up here. Uh, I'm gonna transition to Dr. Barnes. Uh, we have our white narratives research brief on our website, which goes into all of these aspects of how to start unpacking biases um, at the individual, at the organizational um, and at the systems level. Uh, and then Dr. Barnes will now be speaking as it relates to uh, the impact of COVID-19 on uh, SNAP and WIC. Thank you, Jen, for that uh, introduction and that wonderful segue and that wonderful talk um, about uh, white supremacy and food systems. I learned a lot uh, just hearing those narratives. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk specifically about SNAP and WIC and some of the major policy changes that have come out of the COVID-19 crisis. So for all of you policy wonks in, in the, the room, the Zoom room, um, hopefully this will be useful to you. And I hope that you can take some of the insights uh, revealed in this presentation back to your own communities and think about how we can improve these programs to maintain access for SNAP and WIC for vulnerable families. So to give you some background about how race and power uh, 
is at work in the administration of social service programs. We know from the research that uh, the generosity and accessibility of a lot of assistance programs depends on the political ideology of subnational governments. And by that, I mean state and local governments. And in the case of North Carolina, county level governments. So North Carolina is one of um, a dozen states that delivers its social services primarily through a county system. And this county system is responsible for the administrative budget of delivering programs like SNAP, programs like Medicaid. So what happens is you see a lot of variation across these counties in their support for the administration of these programs. And some of that has to do with the resources that each county has. So for example, uh, I'm from um, a disadvantaged, um, uh, prim primarily African-American county in Eastern North Carolina um, that doesn't have a lot of tax revenue to support expanding the Department of Social Services or the local social service agency's workforce, um, which means for a family like mine, because I grew up on a lot of assistance programs, it would make it difficult for me to engage um, the social service agencies because they're understaffed. So uh, some of the stories that you'll hear today about folks having difficulty contacting their SNAP workers or folks having difficulty getting in contact with these assistance programs stems from the underfunding um, that we see in North Carolina for these programs. Um, at the state level, we also see this variation as well. And a lot of research has been done on how um, TANF funding, for example, varies by, again, the political ideology of the state. So if you have a conservative state, um, they're less likely to invest in the delivery of TANF benefits um, than a more liberal or progressive state. And we also see that this funding depends on the percentage, surprise, surprise, of African Americans that are living in the state. So uh, conservative states that have a higher percentage of African Americans tend to spend less on cash assistance programs and adopt more stringent rules and eligibility requirements than more liberal progressive states that have a smaller percentage of African Americans. So a lot of this has to do with political ideology and race, and in particular racism. So that's just the backdrop uh, of this presentation, uh, building off of what Jen just shared. Um, the social service uh, delivery system in the US is not race neutral at all. Uh, a lot of assumptions about who's poor, who's deserving and who's undeserving uh, falls along racial lines and determines a lot about the design of these policies and how they're delivered on the ground. And from my, my um, vantage point, most importantly, how they're experienced by vulnerable families. So just to give you some background on that, um, on how race is at work um, in social service delivery, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about what we've learned about WIC and SNAP participation during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide. So I've been told that I don't need to bury the lead and that I should lead with recommendations. So here are some recommendations we have based on the uh, interviews we conducted over the past year on how to improve WIC and SNAP. And some of this stuff is underway with the new administration. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, so with WIC, we are proposing that um, there's uh, better interventions at the retail level, so within grocery stores, to make WIC easier to use in grocery stores. And some of that is uh, increasing vendor management or monitoring of retailers to ensure that WIC participants are having um, good experiences in the store. It also means communicating federal policy changes effectively um, to retailers. So there's a disconnect between what's happening at the federal level, what's happening at state and local WIC offices, and then what's happening on the ground when WIC participants are trying to use their benefits in the store. And then also um, we're working um, 
with some foundations and some um, state uh, administrators on thinking through a peer education uh, model for assisting uh, WIC participants, especially new WIC participants in learning how to use their, their benefits in the store. And then for SNAP, we're recommending a more grassroots information campaign about how to apply for benefits and more information being disseminated through churches and community organizations and um, organizations that are really close to the ground and close to vulnerable populations, disseminating information about the COVID-19 policy changes and how you can successfully apply for SNAP. And then I'm always advocating for more funding to support the expansion of the DSS workforce. So I've been doing um, for the past five years, I've been doing interviews with workers and uh, program beneficiaries. And one of the things that I've heard from workers within the last year about COVID-19 and about all of these um, stimulus uh, legislations and packages that are designed to support Americans, but also to support um, the administration of these COVID uh, relief policies, is that the CARES Act, which came out uh, last March, was basically an unfunded mandate. So the CARES Act fundamentally transformed um, nutrition assistance and how people access nutrition assistance and how people access social safety net programs like Medicaid. It fundamentally transformed that and made it a lot easier for people to access assistance programs, but it did not provide administrative dollars to states and counties in the case of North Carolina to meet the growing demand for food. So uh, I've interviewed directors of departments of social services and WIC directors, and they've reported this major increase in demand. So a 30 to 40% increase in applications for these programs, but no administrative funding to hire a new worker or two or three or four um, to support um, these new families that are coming into the system, right? Uh, so that's what we'll talk about a little bit today and you'll see uh, some of this and how clients explain their difficulties in accessing uh, these benefits. So I'm always advocating for more funding because you can't fundamentally change policy without supporting the delivery of these policies. That, that There's two sides to the access coin. You can't make it easier without making it easier for people, bureaucrats, agency workers to deliver these programs. Next slide. So the key questions that motivated the work, uh, this larger research study, were um, what are the barriers to accessing, maintaining, and using WIC and SNAP? And then how has COVID-19 influenced access to WIC and SNAP? So those are our two main research questions. Next slide. So before COVID-19, uh, as I mentioned, we had been doing these interviews since 2015, so, so for a while. Um, here were some of the barriers that were mentioned, and this is for both WIC and SNAP. Um, there's variation in the quality of customer service across counties. So in the case of WIC, um, there's some counties that were really um, you know, friendly. They reached out to WIC participants, provided reminders for appointments. Um, really provided high quality customer service. There wasn't a long wait in the clinic. Same thing with SNAP. Some, some counties were uh, really great at ensuring that um, SNAP, SNAP applicants have the right information to apply for programs, that SNAP applicants were treated well. And then there's also this transportation barrier, especially in rural communities, where it's just difficult for people to get downtown because most of the time in, in rural communities, especially North Carolina, a lot of these agencies are, are located in um, the county seat, which is sort of this central location within the county, the downtown area of the county. And if you live you know, 25, 30 minutes out, it's difficult to find transportation to go to uh, the local Department of Social Services to apply for SNAP or to go to the local WIC clinic to apply for uh, WIC. And then there's this variation in outreach and information about these programs. So that's the one major takeaway from this research that we've learned. A lot of people just don't know. They don't know that they're eligible for these programs. They don't know about these major COVID-19 related changes that have made 
life easier for them in terms of accessing these programs. So all levels of government and community partners have an obligation and a responsibility, I think, to improve information sharing. Like let's inform families and communities about these programs and about these changes. And then in the, the WIC space, uh, we, we noticed that there were challenges in using benefits in stores. So that's sort of the perennial problem uh, with the WIC program. Uh, there's a learning curve for WIC participants where they have to figure out you know, which stores are WIC friendly. And then on top of that, how do they actually use their benefits in the store? Like how do you identify WIC approved foods? What do you do when your, your app, because we have eWIC here in North Carolina, when your app isn't functioning correctly, how do you shop when, um, when you're having difficulties finding, you know, which bread's WIC approved, which milk is WIC approved? So there's this learning curve for WIC participants. Next slide. So as I mentioned um, earlier, COVID-19 has fundamentally shifted the way that these programs operate in very, very exciting ways. So through the CARES Act, um, the federal government allowed states to apply for waivers to change um, intake processes for WIC and SNAP. So uh, WIC requires quarterly in-person uh, appointments. Some states have experimented with remote elements of appointments, but by and large, most states require quarterly report appointments that are in person. And um, because of the CARES Act, those appointments were shifted to remote appointments. And instead of um, having participants come in and get their heights and weights to, to assess what's called nutritional risk, which is an eligibility criteria for the program, now WIC participants are self-reporting their height and their weight. Um, and in addition to those remote appointments, they've also loosened up the restrictions on food because WIC um, provides support for a narrow selection of food that's based on dietary recommendations to support child and maternal health. So now they've, they've added these food flexibilities that allow um, WIC participants to substitute out uh, different sizes of bread and juice and fat percentages in milk, in part because a lot of WIC participants were running into food shortages, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when people were buying up, you know, these basic um, sort of staples, um, a milk, eggs, cheese, and so on and so forth. So now we have remote appointments in WIC. Now we also have food flexibilities. In SNAP, we have uh, remote interviews and instead of uh, remote interviews by phone, and instead of having to report income information through pay stubs and the like, now applicants can self-report income so they can say what they're making as opposed to having to provide extensive documentation. We also have extended recertification deadlines, um, emergency allotments for, for SNAP participants, waiving time limits on work requirements, and we have pandemic EBT for school-aged children that were eligible for free or reduced lunch, and now because of remote learning are at home. So parents get some uh, support and some additional nutrition assistance benefits for their kids that are now at home. And this is sort of separate from uh, the CARES Act, but related to it, it sort of came online at the same time. But um, now you can use your SNAP benefits in the state of North Carolina, at least, to purchase food from Walmart Mart or Amazon online. Next slide. Ooh, I think I'm running out of time. So, so we, uh, here's sort of a snapshot of the scope of the study. We've been doing interviews uh, in a, several counties across North Carolina that vary by um, uh, demographic makeup and region and urbanicity. So far, we've conducted 303 interviews, 74 staff interviews, and 229 participant interviews. And I did not conduct all these interviews by myself. Um, oh, five minutes? Oh, OK. I did not conduct these interviews by myself. I had a team of six interviewers that helped me. So we're going to move through uh, pretty quickly. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so here are the findings, highlights. Um, remote appointments, oh, previous slide, I'm sorry. 
So uh, we found that for co for COVID-19 WIC experiences, people really did like the remote appointments. They viewed them as more convenient, but a lot of folks were unaware of the program changes. So only a third of all WIC participants interviewed were aware of the food flexibilities. So a lot of WIC participants learned of these major changes to the program through the interview process. So they learned about that through our interviewers. And even with the food flexibilities, most WIC participants still reported food uh, challenges purchasing food in the store. Next slide. So as you can see across these four counties, most participants are expressing evalu positive evaluations of the remote appointments. Next slide. Um, here's an example of that. So uh, these are two African-American women from uh, a rural and a suburban county. Uh, here's the first quote. Well, when you go to the office, sometimes you have to wait. Well, by doing it over the phone, well, they just let you know. It's much easier because then you don't have to run to the office. It's much easier for everyone and safer. And then here's another example. Very quick. That's the main idea. Very quick call. Set everything up. And that's it for the next three months. I don't really have to travel far to go to an appointment. I can sit and wait at home for them to call me or set up an appointment. I think overall, I'm 100% satisfied. So satisfaction with the remote appointments. Next slide. But again, there's continued difficulty purchasing food in the store. Next slide. Here's an example of that. Um, now, when it first, about two months or three months into the virus, you could not find 1% milk anywhere. It was like everybody wanted milk, milk and eggs, you could not find. Then they changed it to where they allowed you to get whole milk, but it still wouldn't allow me to get whole milk. So this woman was actually aware of the food flexibilities, but she still had difficulty using her food flexibilities in the store because the retailer hadn't updated their system to allow her to purchase whole milk. Next slide. So the key takeaways from the COVID-19 policy changes with WIC, remote appointments increase participant satisfaction with customer service, but there's still these challenges and redeeming benefits in the store. Next slide. Um, okay, so um, with the SNAP policy changes, the assumption that these remote appointments and interviews would make things more accessible for clients hasn't borne out in the data. So the telework option or these remote interviews has not actually made workers more accessible. So 60% of our sample reported negative interactions with DSS and SNAP workers. And the chief complaint was the difficulty they had in contacting workers. And this was most prevalent in urban counties where 75% of the respondents reported difficulties. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, no, this slide, this is fine. So here's an example of that from an urban and suburban county. We always get an automated service. That one was so frustrating. Oh my goodness, because every time you call somebody, you're talking to a machine. You're not talking to an actual agent. None of the workers are anything. Then here's an example from the suburban county. I can say that I've had a lot of issues with workers because they don't call you back. Like I was trying to add my niece to her SNAP benefits at one point and I couldn't get anyone to call you back, call me back or you wanna let somebody know that your benefits aren't working or something happens. Like my benefits stop working with no notice. Her benefits stop working with no notice. It took me over a month to get somebody to call me back. So she had to wait an entire month to have her issue with her benefits resolved because the workers were inaccessible. And I'll stop there because I have run out of time. I'm so sorry. Hopefully I can address any questions that you have in the Q&A. Thank you so much. We will at this time move over to the Q&A portion of the workshop. And um, we have a few questions here that we have a few minutes to get to. The first one is from Clinton. He would like to ask, based on the nature of this historic structure of food deserts and the power inequity, how do we best invest in people and communities to empower them with self-determination and food systems? Great, well, thanks for asking that question and I'll take the, uh, the first crack at that and then see if Ali has anything that she wants to add to that one. Uh, because really what this is about is uh, how as predominantly white institutions, do we leverage the power and privilege that we have to work 
in support of as opposed to on behalf of. And an example of this is a food bank in Southwest Arizona that's working specifically on uh, capacity building and entrepreneurship development for um, its clients to really help build business and help build business food-based business across the supply chain in order to build community wealth um, and communal wealth as well. Uh, Ali, uh, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think it's just important to think through like what you were saying of, it's about that community and sort of not even asking, I guess it's sort of saying like, it's not an assumption of, why should we invest or how should we do it? It's just like invest in those communities because they have the infrastructure to take that money and do some great change that. And instead we're constantly asking sort of those process questions of like, well, how can we have to protect this money to make sure we have this great return on investment instead of thinking through of like, well, sometimes the things you can't measure are like the impact they have on well-being, not just like the economic impact and sort of just people's lives and thinking through how you can just decide that community instead of thinking of like are they worth the investment just being like they are worth the investment and start from that perspective rather than um, having to think through sort of are they worth it or not thanks Allie. i think this one is for dr barnes um in most states snap is state administered but in a handful of states it is county administered do we have any sense of whether it would be more equitable if the states with county administered programs shifted to state administered or would the same problems exist I think that you would still see variation across states and some of the performance outcomes that are tied to SNAP. So um, uh, SNAP workers or SNAP programs are measured by how quickly they process cases and how accurately they process cases and um, denial rates as well. And we've seen in some of the research done that there isn't any difference across state and county um, uh, programs um, in terms of the denial rates, but there is this difference by political ideology. So you still see conservative Southern states increasingly denying um, applicants relative to more progressive um, states in other regions of the country. And then you also, in North Carolina, I think you also see this variation across counties by, you know, political support for this administration of programs. I think the issue is the cost sharing agreement at the federal level. One of the things that I didn't explain is that while SNAP is an entitlement program, half of the administrative budget is covered by the federal government. The other half is supposed to be covered by the states. And in the case of North Carolina, the state shifts that cost to counties. So my um, point of advocacy has been to increase that funding, especially now during the COVID-19 pandemic when you do see an increase in demand. And the federal government in this newest iteration of the stimulus package has done that. They've increased administrative funds to states. It'll be interesting to see how that um, plays out and how that, that funding is allocated. Um, but broadly speaking, you still see the, the variation by um, political ideology and region. And I think one way to eliminate that variation, whether it's at the state level or the county level, is for the federal government to provide more money for administration. Thank you. Um, this is somewhat related to the first question, but are there any limitations to or reasons why charity or charities can't be a part of systemic change, like investing in economic development and the creation of food-based economies in neighborhoods and communities of color? Uh, I will uh, love to answer that question. And I guess, um, a little confused about if it if by charity it means um, like philanthropic giving or if that means um, folks who are doing kind of the direct service provision. So first I'll answer from the direct service provision um, organizations that are framed as charity based organizations. The answer is absolutely yes. I mean, there are, I think, um, and Ali, check me if I'm incorrect on this, I think something like 60,000 uh, food pantries across the United States, um, all working, you know, in some relationship often to food banks. 
And uh, the work of Why Hunger and Closing the Hunger Gap is all around you know, how these organizations can be working together on advocacy and advocacy, you know, kind of to Dr. Barnes's presentation to support the systems that should be in place um, from that federal level. Uh, but then also, you know, there's also these examples, uh, as I mentioned previously, about how they can also shift to transform the work that they're doing in community that is leveraging the resources that they have to build the capacity of those organizations themselves. And then just to answer from the foundation, so the, the charity giving perspective, um, the percentage of black and brown led organizations that receive direct funding from foundations is, is highly inequitable. And uh, black and brown led organizations in terms also of general operating dollars get uh, about 62% less general operating dollars than white led counterparts. And there's a lot of um, you know, impact as it relates to how um, community led community accountable organizations because of relationship have different impacts in their own community. So directing more philanthropic dollars into black and brown led organizations is also another way to make a greater impact. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, with that, I just wanna say thank you to both of you as well as Ali um, for, all, for your presentation, your insight. You have really provided such a strong foundation on white supremacy within the food system, as well as the pandemic's impact on WIC and SNAP. I'm sure that all of us will be building upon these learnings as we go back to our respective organizations and work. For those of you on uh, today's workshop that are interested in learning more about food justice, I would really encourage all of you to check out our new Conversations on Food Justice series which is a collaboration with the Aspen Institute, as well as Share Our Strength. And it examines the roots and evolution of the food movement and how it intersects with race and class, as well as health, educational and environmental inequities. Our next session is coming up on April 1st, and it's centered around food sovereignty, food and justice for native peoples. We know that if we don't aim our efforts towards justice, then our anti-hunger work, although very important and essential, will just be a band-aid and not really the solution. So with that, we will now take a five minute break and then I'll meet you back for our next session. Thank you so much for joining us today. See you soon.